we're in our, our ninth year of bringing very fine scholars to this uh, campus in order to share with the community and with the university uh, in the spirit of engagement, talking about uh, pivotal moments in, um, in human history. Uh, we exist because of the uh, generous support of a number of people I'd like to mention. Uh, the Department of History and Political Science, uh, Dr. Catherine Brown, who is our chair. Uh, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Dr. David Yells, who is our dean. The Office of Academic Affairs, and Dr. Ian Wilson, who's the vice president for academic affairs. Uh, the Peace and Justice Studies program, Dr. Michael Mitch, who's the director and uh, the Office of the President, so a special thank you to President Matt Holland. Uh, and also, I uh, have to say thank you to all of the students and staff and faculty associated with the department whose, uh, whose hard work has made this evening possible. We are, are thrilled uh, to add Taylor Branch this evening to the list of scholars who we've hosted since 2003. Uh, Mr. Branch was born in Atlanta in 1968, he earned a bachelor degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a master's in public administration from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton two years later. And he holds honorary doctorates from eight colleges and universities. He started his writing career that same year as a journalist with the Washington Monthly and Harper's and Esquire. Taylor Branch is the author of several works including the remarkable trilogy about the civil rights movement in the crucial years from 1954 to 1968, entitled America in the King Years. The link between Dr. King and the present, the reason that history ought to be more than some annoying liberal arts course that we have to check off of our list in order to get a degree, uh, the reason lies in the essence of the Republic itself. As Mr. Branch wrote in a New York Times op-ed piece in 2008, quote, to see Dr. King and his colleagues as anything less than modern founders of democracy itself, even as racial healers and reconcilers, is to diminish them under the spell of myth. His awards include the National Book Award, the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award, the National Book Critics Award, a Pulitzer Prize in History, a Guggenheim Fellowship and MacArthur Fellowship, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for Lifetime Achievement. Mr. Branch's most recent book is the Clinton Tapes Wrestling History with the President, which is a memoir of President Clinton based on private meetings between the two over an eight-year period. The title of the lecture this evening is 40 Years After King, Looking Ahead with Obama. And we're going to leave a few minutes at the end of the talk for questions and comments from you. So uh, uh, that's your task over the next little while is to write down a question for him. And then following this session, Mr. Branch has agreed to sign copies of his books uh, out in the lobby. And those books are also available uh, for uh, purchase. So ladies and gentlemen, it is really an honor for me to introduce you to Mr. Taylor Branch. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I think given the topic that we picked long ago, that the world has conspired to help me convince you that the civil rights movement is not about the past, not about somebody different from you and quaint, uh, but is about things very vital to you and about the future. Um, I hope to persuade you uh, to take a fresh look at it in, in that light. Uh, Bill read that, that quote about modern founders. Um, why would the people from the civil rights movement be modern founders, meaning fulfilling the same role that the founding fathers fulfilled in creating the republic? That's what I want to discuss about, because if I can engage you with that, as it has taken possession of me, it may be fruit for thought uh, that you could take forward here, or at least ask me a question or tell me I'm full of it by the end. Um, I want to begin by saying that it's not natural. Um, I share something with you. I'm a white kid who grew up in segregated South, 
who spent 24 years of my life in utter enthrallment studying a black-led movement uh, as an outsider. Uh, that's no more remarkable than it would be for you to devote yourself from the state of Utah to the diversity of the world coming out of a state like this. So in that sense, I identify with you. I grew up uh, in the 1950s. My dad was a dry cleaner. We were resolutely disinterested in politics. Uh, in fact, his rule for our family was that anyone interested in politics cannot find honest work. Um, so avoid it. It kind of sounds like the beehive. Uh, so maybe you have some of that uh, here too. The civil rights movement started in my childhood. I was in first grade when the Brown decision occurred, outlawing segregation. I was starting, I was finishing junior high when the sit-ins started. I started high school the year of the Freedom Rides. I graduated from high school in the year of Mississippi summer, 1964, when a thousand white kids went to the South just to register black voters in Mississippi, and three of them were murdered on the very first night that they arrived by a sheriff. Um, I went to college. My freshman year was the Selma March, which is now celebrated around the world. And I finished college in the year that Dr. King was killed. It was going on all around me. It was terrifying. I did my best to avoid it. And then when I started interviewing people, I found that there were a lot of people who had that same sense of avoidance. 90% of the people who tell you they were involved in the civil rights movement are lying. Uh, it, it was a very frightening event um, for very good reason. My own experience came about partly through my dad's dry cleaning plant. I started working there when I was five or six. All of his employees were black. They supervised me as a pain in the neck to them because I was the boss's son, but I was unruly and they had to teach me things. I noticed when I was very small that my dad had a, very, a special relationship with the cleaner in the dry cleaning plant. That's the person who puts the clothes in the wheel and spots dry cleaning is without, dry cleaning was without water. Uh, they used in those days a very cancer-causing uh, dry cleaning agent called perchloroethylene that killed Peter and my father uh, with cancer, but we didn't know that at the time. It, they had a striking relationship because Peter would arrive every morning in a three-piece suit and these alligator shoes looking like he was going to meet the Queen of England, a very skinny black man. Years later, my dad told me that Peter informed him that, that the safest way for a black person to get across the city of Atlanta before 6 o'clock in the morning was to dress like that um, because there was a lot of racial tension in the air. But when he got to the dry cleaning plant, he and my dad started bantering. They're two of a rare species who can remember every joke they've ever heard and tell them uh, and get a laugh every time, and they would be bantering. And they had a bet daily on our local baseball team. We had a minor league team. There were no major league teams in the South because it was segregated. Our minor league team was called the Atlanta Crackers. Uh, I kid you not. Um, you can look it up on the internet, and while you're at it, you can look up the name of the Negro League team in Atlanta, which was the Atlanta Black Crackers, which is even weirder. Um, my dad and Peter had a bet daily on the, on the game. Peter, of course, bet against the Crackers, since it was a segregated team, and my dad bet a quarter on it. And occasionally, they would take me to the game. And the reason I mention this to you is just to give you a little bit of the introduction to, to how foreign and alien the race world was then. We would ride down to Ponce de Leon Ballpark in downtown Atlanta in the truck, and my dad and Peter would be telling jokes the whole way. And then as we got near, the jokes would kind of die out. Things would get a little somber. We'd have to split up going to the park because this the park was segregated. So Peter had to go sit in the colored section way in the, out, in the outfield. And they had to make, figure out ways to get together at the end. And it was somewhat controversial just to be riding there together, but certainly they had to be segregated. 
I didn't pay any attention to this until a couple of times, and it's one of my early defining memories when I was seven or eight years old, walking toward the game. My dad would say, I don't like this. Not, as I said, any sense of politics. His belief was if everybody kept their nose to the grindstone and worked hard, all these problems and bickering over race and everything else would go away and that politics was not the way politicians mess things up. He was very contemporary, actually. Um, but when he said, I don't like this, I, I took it to mean only that he, he, he didn't like not being able to keep telling jokes and that in a perfect world he would do that. Not that he could imagine a perfect world any more than he could imagine making rain clouds go away. You didn't think you could change something like that. What I really remember even more was that at a young age, that young, I knew that this was a radioactive statement and that I was not to say why. I, I didn't say a word. I was silent. I didn't say why, what do you mean, Dad? Anything, because even at that young, I knew that there was something really primal and radioactive about race and that my dad had said something um, un unusual, that this was a, a big pronouncement. So I didn't say anything about it. That's kind of what race was like then. It was intimate but fearful. I saw it even more just a couple of years later when Peter died of this cancer. Um, I was maybe 10, nine or 10. My dad took me to the funeral. It's the first time I've ever been in a black church. Uh, we were the only two white people there. Um, how many of you have been to a black funeral in a black church? A few. It's, it, it, for me, my eyes were this big. You're in this church, they're playing the organ. The body is right there. Peter, whom I knew, I had first dead person I'd ever seen. And then all of a sudden, people started getting up and have, I thought they were having a heart attack. <laughs> They would get up and they would fall over and then nurses would come. I thought they were nurses. They were really church uniform people with white and a sash and they would come down and carry them out. And it was very dramatic. And then the preacher got up there and said, I see Mr. Branch is here. Would he like to come up and say a word in the middle of the, sermon, in the, of the funeral? It was the only public speech I ever saw my father give in his whole life. Got up in this pulpit, didn't know anybody, and started telling stories about Peter Mitchell, and completely broke down in the pulpit. If you're 10 years old, and you in an experience like this, and you see your father break down, you start wondering, where, where does this come from? That there's clearly a strong bond there, and yet we never went to Peter's home. The divisions were very, very strong. Uh, there was something alien and intimate all at once. That's what the race world was like then. And to get involved in it as a white person was fearful. And I, of course, I later learned that getting involved in it as a black person to risk your life and limb to try to change things was also fearful. Now, the reason that I want to set up these barriers, cultural barriers, in front of fundamental political issues, is to jump right to today and try to make a connection with you in the sense, look what has gone on in the last 60 days across the Middle East. A revolution has started in the hands of young people confronting societies in which they had absolutely no political power, where they were excluded, where no democracy existed as far as they were concerned, where young people are 60% of the population and more, where their unemployment rate in Egypt and Libya runs uh, close to 70, 80%. And my question to you is why has it not been that the American Civil Rights Movement is a model for how those young people 
might try to bring about a revolution in their countries. Think about it. In the American South, there were 75 million people in 1960 in 17 states whose constitutions all made it a uh, subversion to challenge the segregation laws that divided the races. So thoroughly that black people were excluded from going into public libraries, that they were excluded from voting, that almost 90% of the men were day laborers and a heavy percentage of the women who worked were maids. They were invisible when they died, they weren't put in the newspaper. They had no traditional tools of, of political reform, no vote, no armies, no newspapers, no major ways to do anything. And the idea that they could bring about a democratizing revolution on the model of the American Revolution to bring about freedom was as foreign as the notion that teenagers in Tunisia could overthrow a dictatorship 60 days ago. And yet they did it. And it was remarkable what they did. And when they did it, and they set about to say, this is up to us. If we really believe that we own an equal share of this country and that our responsibility is equal to the president's and our vote counts the same as the president, then the first thing we need to do is act like it. They were taking civics seriously of necessity in a way that few of us do and which young people throughout the Middle East and old too, but remarkably young youth leadership are struggling with issues all anew. And so were these young people then. The first sit-ins, remarkably, were treated as a panty raid. The newspaper stories wrote about them as though they were panty raids because the idea of young people, particularly young African Americans, being involved in a serious problem of the country was so foreign that people didn't take it seriously. They assumed if they're making a disruption, it's some sort of juvenile joke like a panty raid. So it was a foreign idea. And yet, six, eight years later, these people are leading political demonstrations that have the whole country by the throat over whether or not a bus in Birmingham, Alabama can literally move out of the bus station with a young college black kid and a young college white kid sitting side by side because mobs and the governor of Alabama are dedicated to prevent any kind of motion in that sort of integration and see it as a threat to their way of life. These are very, these were really um, big mobilizations about very fundamental things. But because it was so foreign, the world that it came out of was so foreign to the public culture of the United States, to the Huntley Brinkley, to the people in the news, to the interpreters, to the columnists. They had no clue what these people were doing. It was very foreign. And the idea that they had a chance to win was foreign. What chance did they have? They, have no, they had no, all they had was an appeal to American values and their and strange tactics that they were developing, staying up arguing all night, but we didn't even know that they were doing that. The common prediction at the time was, by the time it really became enough of an upheaval to generate any interest and notice in the political classes in the United States, was that number one, it wouldn't stand a chance of winning because the Southern politicians were unanimously opposed to it and said that in order to force the South to integrate and allow black people to vote and, and go into regular schools and go into lunch counters and go into hotels and movie theaters would, was so offensive that the Southern people would resist it with violence and that in order, the only way to overcome that would be to have the federal government put troops on every street corner. In other words, become a totalitarian big state. That that's the only way it would happen and that we're not willing to do that because it would enslave white people. Richard Russell, my senator from Georgia, said to do this also economically 
would be disastrous for the South because it would impose such rigid restrictions on the country to require black people and white people to work together that he said the common garden variety white person would have no chance to succeed in the economy and the southern economy would shrivel up and go away. Therefore, we can't do it. On and on and on said, the way that we are now cannot be changed without things that are so repugnant to the way, American way of life and that would require such a government intrusiveness, a big brother, troops on every corner, that it can't happen. Now, in fact, none of that happened. Those laws that were passed at the instigation and the catalyzation of young black people, many of them your age and younger, college kids, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and the hidden one, the Immigration Reform Act of 1965, which over repealed um, legal immigration had been restricted to white people in the United States. Uh, and, it, and it instigated first come, first serve uh, immigration that allowed f Asian families, African families, uh, made our naturalization ceremonies what they are today, like a little United Nations. Uh, inspired by these young people, the President of the United States said, henceforth it's first come, first serve. There is no foreigner too foreign to be a fellow citizen, and never again will the twin barriers of prejudice and, and privilege shadow the gate to freedom. So they let loose all of these things, all of these freedoms. Uh, in that time, not just for ending segregation and terror, the things that you read about the civil rights movement, the dogs and the fire hoses, not just for those things. But think about the things that were set loose in that that benefited everyone else. Even my Atlanta crackers. The mayor of Atlanta said that as soon as the segregation law meant that we could attract international and national business, without having to divert all of our attention to squabbles over race issues and whether people coming in, or a businessman coming from London is gonna get arrested because he's a black person in the wrong place. Once we didn't have to worry about that, the city of Atlanta in the same year built a, a sports stadium on land we didn't own with money we didn't have for a team we hadn't located. And within six months, we lured the Milwaukee Braves to come to Atlanta, become the Atlanta Braves, the first major league sports franchise in the South. Danny Thomas was organizing the Miami Dolphins in Miami because without segregation, the South became open for business. Its, its energies were liberated from the obsession of enforcing the race segregation code. You never heard of the Sun Belt when it was segregated. We were the hookworm belt. The Civil Rights Movement liberated the White South economically and also politically. As long as it was segregated, it was a one-party dictatorship necessary to enforce white supremacy. As soon as black people gained the right to vote, we began to have two-party competition in the South, which destigmatized Southern politicians and allowed Southern politicians to stand for national office, and in fact, the leadership of the new Republican Party came all out of the Southern Republicans who didn't even exist until the Civil Rights Movement allowed them to exist. They rose up to oppose the Civil Rights Movement, saying this wasn't any good. When I was growing up, we didn't have any Republicans in the South. Republicans were scarce as polar bears. The Republican was a, a, sim, a synonym for Yankee because they had made the Civil War. And the de Democrats had instituted segregation to salve our wounds from the Civil War. Now, all of a sudden, this civil rights movement has somehow screwed up our politics. We've got uh, competition. We have new stuff. We have a new economy. And the next thing you know, also in that bill, it said women have to have equal pay, just like black folks. The New York Times in 1964 segregated its want ads 
not just by race, but by sex, help wanted male, help wanted female. Go back and look at it. Take out any issue of the New York Times in 1964. Look at the want ads. Help wanted female, the most common advertisement for women was Girl Friday, which was kind of a jack of all trades in, in that time. Things that you cannot imagine. When I went to Chapel Hill, by state law in North Carolina, females, white females, it was still segregated, we were just getting our first black students, but we had no women because state law said that females could not come to the state university unless they were in nursing school. So Chapel Hill had 5% female students. It now has 65% female students as a result of things set in motion by the civil rights movement. Every, every parent of a daughter today who would stop to think for one minute about the opportunities available to that daughter for where to go to school, for what to do, for what professions may be open to her, for what sports may be open for her, stands on the shoulders of the civil rights movement that opened up all of these opportunities. Now, did this happen on the strength of federal soldiers standing on every street corner in the South? Did it? Did it vastly magnify the military presence or even the law enforcement presence of the federal government in the South, which was the way the whole issue was argued at the time? Absolutely not. There are no soldiers standing on the street corners. It was a remark. There was plenty of conflict. But by the standards of historical transformations of that magnitude, it, it was a remarkable liberation. And what I'm here to tell you today, in part, is that the most remarkable thing about it was, is that all of the resistance and the predictions to how horrible this were going to be turned out to be false. It liberated the white South. It liberated white women. It liberated, yes, it, it desegregated um, the South for black folks too, but it spread all of these benefits in the American tradition of what freedom really means, disproving the predictions of how terrible it would be, and yet we still hold on to those lessons that this is when politics really went off the rails, when big government started getting in our business and telling us stuff not to do, when government became an object of scorn because the, because the country was not really emotionally involved in these. They were done, people felt that these were things done to us. And we tended to resent them rather than looking at a cool eye in the, at, at the liberations that they set loose. The appreciation for the civil rights movement, ironically, spread around the world so that when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, they were singing, We Shall Overcome, when they took down the Berlin Wall and in Prague at the Velvet Revolution, because they knew that was the inspiration for an end to tyranny without a new nuclear Armageddon. They had had these sit-ins in Gdansk, in Poland, modeled on the sit-ins here. And when Nelson Mandela came out, we had all thought apartheid wouldn't end, without nuclear war there, and he says we need a biracial democracy and nonviolence, and we have that miracle that nobody expected, and, and it was there too. The spirit of liberation and freedom that is the true inheritance of the civil rights movement and of the American Revolution is alive more outside the United States in many respects than it is here. Even Tiananmen Square in 1989 was modeled on a sit-in. They stood in front of those tanks. There have been rebellions, civil wars for 5,000 years in China, but this is the first one that was ever modeled on a nonviolent sit-in. Now, it did not end tyranny in China. It has gotten worse. But neither is that forgotten. And whenever things do open up in China, that will come back again. Not as a perfect model. I'm, I'm not saying that this is a perfect model, I, but I am saying that it is pertinent. And the experience of the American Civil Rights Movement, in my view, is the most pertinent 
analogy that we, as Americans, might be offering to those students in Libya and in, and in Bahrain and, and in Iraq and everywhere else. We have lost sight of our own best example. My favorite example to offer to you for what it felt like, because uh, let me tell you just a couple of stories about Diane Nash. She's my favorite character from the civil rights era. Dr. King, when the Freedom Rides happened, was 32. So very young by today's standards. He, could, he was in, right in the age that could be in some of the revolutions in the Middle East now. Diane was 20. She was young. She was from Chicago. She was a Miss America contestant. Um, she was so light she could pass for white, but then somebody found out that she was not white, and she lost out on the, in the Miss America contest in, in Chicago. Went south to schools. The first time she encountered segregation was stung by it, that she was forced, run out of shops, couldn't, couldn't eat, and that sort of thing. She knew it existed, but she had never felt it. She was so upset about it, she said, isn't somebody doing anything about it? People looked at her like she was crazy. She finally found, she poked all around in Nashville, where she was going to school, found a librarian, librarians always know things, who told her that she had heard that there was a group in the basement of a Baptist church that was having meetings to do something about segregation. So Diane went to these meetings. They were led by a guy named Jim Lawson, who lives in uh, Los Angeles. Um, he had been a pacifist. Um, was a Methodist minister and was having classes on nonviolence, a workshop for black kids to go protest. This is in the 50s. This is before the sit-ins. They're thinking about it. The first night Diane got there, Jim Lawson asked for a, he, he gave a lecture about nonviolence, why nonviolence was a perfect weapon, a leadership weapon. He was having a heart, it was very abstract. He was having a hard time. He finally invited uh, a kid up uh, to stand in front of him and asked him to spit in his face. Uh, everybody gasped. People thought it was crazy. The kid said, of course I'm not going to do that. Lawson baited the kid to do it, saying he was going to have to do a lot harder things than that if he ever dreamed of overcoming segregation in the South. Finally, the guy... 18 years old or something, lets loose and spits right into Lawson's face. He smiles, asks him for a handkerchief, wipes spit off of his face, turns to the students and said, what did you feel in the instant when the spit was hitting my face? What did you feel? Did you think I was going to hit him? Did you, think, did you think, was there hatred between us? Was it so raw that you couldn't look? How many of you looked away? He says, what I'm trying to tell you through nonviolence is that in that moment when the spit was coming at me, there's a nuclear energy in the potential for contact one way or another. We will never be the same. And the way I behave on that and after that, in that split second, and the way we talk, says a lot about what lies between us. There's a potential of nuclear energy to build contacts between people who are utter strangers and enemies, the way you feel when somebody spits at you. There's a nuclear energy in that that is stronger than all of the hatreds in the world. And I don't care whether you get it from Jesus or from Gandhi or from your mother or what, but there's nuclear power in this nonviolence. Diane is watching this. This is one of many, many workshops. Lawson, Lawson is a great, um, like a Socrates. She went up and said, how could this ever work? I have been taught in my political science class that government is violence, that it's a monopoly of legitimate violence. That's the definition. So how can nonviolence do anything in the South, when the laws have all the police, they have all the laws, they have all the judges, they have all the courthouse, they have all, how could we stop them by spitting in each other's face? And he said, 
keep coming back, keep coming back. So she kept coming back. Ultimately, uh, when the sit-in started, she had been in his workshops for about six months. Um, a few days after the sit-in started, this workshop from Nashville that had John Lewis in it, James Bevel, lots and lots of people who became um, great figures in the civil rights movement, they led and became the most disciplined nonviolent team. The first night that Diane went, she collapsed beforehand. She was only supposed to be an observer. She didn't want to get involved. She said nobody in her family had ever gone to jail. Uh, that it would ruin her, that her parents wouldn't understand it. And her roommate said, nobody in my family's ever gone to college. They can have their lunch counter. I'm not getting involved. But Diane went, saw violence perpetrated against the people that she had been, that she was observing. They were getting beaten, people were putting cigarettes out on them. And her reaction to that, like she called it a spitting moment, was that she took the place of somebody that got beaten. She went off to jail. She, from jail, said that if the system that put her in jail was unfair, it was unfair to accept bail. So the next thing you know, she, she's kind of tangy. She got up in front of the judge and said, I'm not accepting bail, I'm staying in jail for as long as you want. This, this became a contagion. So everybody else in Nashville, the next thing you know, Nashville has 200 college students staying in jail and refusing to come out. And the mayor is trying to get them out because it is getting publicity against Nashville. This was the beginning of the Nashville sit-in movement. A year later, they were celebrating a 60-day campaign, nonviolently, to integrate Nashville's movie theaters, where they had their first night marches with kids and Klansmen up on the roofs dropping bricks in night marches, hitting nonviolent people on the shoulder. There were a lot of serious injuries there, but the theaters were integrated. They were having a picnic on Mother's Day in 1961 to celebrate this campaign. It had been grueling. There had been a lot of injuries. They were walking to a lakeside to have a picnic when word came in that the Freedom Riders, the adult Freedom Riders, had gotten into Birmingham and that the Klan had beaten every one of them so severely and they had been stuck there. They went to the airport. Planes wouldn't take them out because there were threats to blow up the planes. They were besieged in the airport. They couldn't get in, they couldn't get out. The Kennedy administration finally sent in people to get them out on a plane, and they went home. The Freedom Rides were over. Diane Nash walks into the picnic <laughs> and said, in a, in a moment that is so applicable to the first violence in Libya, uh, and, and what happens there, and what's going on, or at least I thought it was, I'm, I'm not sure. She said, if, the if, the, if violence can stop the movement, then the movement is dead. We cannot allow that happen. So we have to stop this picnic and go down there and get on those buses and continue the freedom rides to show that violence can't stop the movement. Now these are college students in Nashville and all this horrible Klan violence has taken place in Birmingham. The other kids said to Diane, maybe we could do that next week. We need this picnic. Jesus, Jesus fasted 40 days and, and he got milk and honey. You know, he got honey and locusts. We've been getting bricks dropped on us for 40 days. At least we get this picnic. And she said, okay, fine, you go ahead and eat your potato chips. And she did it in a kind of a scornful way. Her later husband, who was crazy in his own way, said that when Diane Nash got on you like that, it was kind of like the leeches that got on Humphrey Bogart in the film The African Queen down in the river, and that there was no help. So finally the picnic, the picnic evaporated, and by the next day, 17 kids from Nashville, no adults, are on a bus, to go down to Birmingham and go right into the bus station where the, the adults had been beaten and start the Freedom Rides all over again. 
Now Bobby Kennedy's mad. This is embarrassing my brother. The whole world, there were journalists from a hundred countries watching to see whether these kids could get out of the Birmingham bus terminal. And they were back and forth and the governors are involved. The whole world starting to get involved. And of course, this is what a movement really is. It starts as something that is as small as the inspiration or wondering about the spit or what, what to do. And people take risks and they take a leap into the unknown, be it as small as going into a black church or my black students, I would always teach them, I would say, I want you to go to a synagogue for Friday night worship by yourself and come back and tell the class how you were treated because that will build up your, your, your sense of literacy of taking leaps into the unknown risks. So they did this and the movement grew and when you take those risks and find that other people are worried about the same sort of things, then your sense of the possible expands. That literally is what a movement is about. For Diane to say that what goes on in Birmingham is, a, is, is, a, is an issue for us here in Nashville worrying about the Nashville movie theaters. They were saying we're going to march through the yellow pages of Nashville. We're going to integrate everything. But she's saying that something somewhere else is our problem. That is movement in and of itself. It's conceptual movement. The buses are moving, um, conceptual movement. You've got the whole world trying to figure out about these buses. She expanded. Her, her story is pretty amazing. Just two years later, she's on Martin Luther King's staff in Birmingham when his great campaign in Birmingham is going down the tubes. Dr. King said, for nine years since the Brown decision, the resistance to the integration movement has been or organizing more rapidly than we have. The Southern Klan, the White Citizens Councils, the massive resistance. We're losing our window in history. We have to make a big leap. So he went to Birmingham, the toughest city in segregation, and started mounting demonstrations. But after a month, so many terrible things had happened inside Bull Connor's jail that they couldn't get any more black um, uh, adults to go to jail. Jim Lawson, the same Jim Lawson, was there teaching them and exhorting them, and he couldn't get any more. So Diane had been w running youth workshops, and she started saying, well, before we retreat and give up here, you should start having high school students go. And her husband said, well, what about junior high students? And people were aghast that you would use children in a war like this that's as serious as segregation was with the kind of violence that was being inflicted on these people. And Diane got up in, in, the, in the faces of some of the adults who came and said, this is insane. You came here promising to integrate and bring freedom. We've had nothing but conflict black people getting fired, horrible things happening in the jail. It's going to set us back 50 years. And now you want to put our children in jail, ensuring that they will never have a future, what little future they may have had, before you limp out of town. And Diane got up and said, yes, your children have to do this because you didn't do for freedom what you should have done for them 40 years ago. So your children can do it, and you in your churches allow them to determine their eternal destiny at the age of six or seven years old when they accept baptism, and you're going to tell them that they can't witness for freedom? And it put Dr. King in a tremendous quandary about what to do. This is the kind of decision that I believe is going on over in the Middle East today. How do we do this? How do we witness? There are some conflicts in human nature where words and reason are not enough, you have to magnify it with sacrifice and witness. And on May 2nd, 1963, Dr. King let Diane Nash and her husband and a few other people, uh, Andy Young, I know you've had Andy Young here, Andy Young was kind of on the, on the fence about what to do with whether this was gonna be suicidal, because if it didn't work, the whole movement is discredited. They were probably all gonna go to jail for for um, uh, contributing to the delinquency of minors. On May 2nd, 1,000 
children went to jail in, in Birmingham. The next day, the jails were full, and so the Bull Connor brings out dogs and fire hoses, thinking that he's doing them a favor that these young kids will be scared of the dogs and fire hoses and will run away. But of course they don't. They keep singing songs, just like I sang in Sunday school, about freedom. And they marched right toward the dogs and fire hoses and Bull Connor let them loose. And the whole world noticed that. And Martin Luther King, of course, said, uh, this is the day when the freedom movement has touched the hearts of the whole world and given birth to the notion, the reality, that we have in our Christian faith, and in some senses we have in our civic faith, that in the long run, our power and our civilization goes against the grain of violence. When they took out, put those dogs and fire hoses on those children, mostly girls, by the way, as young as six years old, they were ensuring not that they were going to defeat the movement with violence, but that the movement was going to defeat their violence with freedom. Only a few months later, the Birmingham church bombing occurred right at the church where the kids marched out. Diane Nash told me that she and her husband broke up furniture and broke windows when they got the news because they felt so responsible it had been their idea to have these children. They still thought it was a good idea, but they felt responsible. They called people to see if they could assassinate the bombers. Everybody knew who did the bombing. And the idea of kind of a vigilante response was in the air. This was already the time of Malcolm X, but you know, it was quite popular. But by the next morning, they said, what we really know is nonviolence, and is it possible that we could conceive of something on the scale of this violence that could atone for it out of what we know through nonviolence. And by literally the next morning, this is September 16th, 1963, the bombing was Sunday the 15th, Diane has a document called a plan for a nonviolent army to immobilize the state of Alabama until it gives black people the right to vote. And she got in her car and drove to Birmingham, she wasn't in Birmingham, uh, she was at, an, at another movement, and drove and broke in on the funeral preparations for Martin Luther King, who was preparing to go see President Kennedy with his plan and said, we have to do it. People are in the streets now willing to give their lives. You have to give them an outlet for their willingness to sacrifice. And Dr. King said, Diane, we've been campaigning for 10 years to get a law. We have a bill to outlaw segregation in Congress. We can't just turn around and say, we've changed our mind. We want to work on Diane's voting plan. And uh, so he put her off. But Again, she pestered him until that plan was the Selma Voting Rights Campaign. It came out of a 21-year-old woman's overnight term paper by somebody who, as I, as I said before, didn't believe that it was her responsibility to say, oh, we need another president or in six years, I'll be old enough to do something about this. That's what I was saying then. I was, I was 16 that time. I was saying, when I get really old, like maybe 30, this race thing is getting serious, and I'll have to stick my toe in the water. And I turn around, and there are these six-year-old girls not waiting until they're 30, marching into dogs and fire hoses. And I'm saying, whoa, where is this coming from? And this finally, relentlessly turned the direction of my own life's interests around in a different direction against my will. For Diane, she's saying, I see this thing happening. I'm not going to write a letter. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to say it's somebody else's fault. I, it's up to me, even though I'm not allowed to vote, to design a response to this as a citizen to correct it. And so she designed the Selma Voting Rights Movement. And by the time they marched into Selma on March 25th, 1965, the third time, there were 70,000 people coming in there, and you could literally feel history change. That's how movement had expanded from the earliest small inspirations through all of the all-night meetings. What do we do? How do we get this in the newspapers? What's our next step? How are we true to our convictions and also be politically effective? 
All of that, by the time it got into Selma, into Montgomery, you knew the Voting Rights Act was going to happen. You knew the South would never be the same. You knew that this was somehow connected, as Lyndon Johnson said, that this was a moment when freedom and politics meet as they did at Appomattox and as they did at Concord in Lexington in the American Revolution. So again, it happened at Selma when they marched um, for the right to vote and the Voting Rights Act happened. That was movement. That was, and, those, and there are movements now in the Middle East. Movement was the watchword of politics. Today's watchword of politics, I am sad to report to you, is spin. Spin meaning that it's all going around anywhere. It's not going anywhere, and it's just a game of entertainment for the self-interest of whoever is trying to spin something. That it has no inherent purpose that it has no inherent value to us except maybe as a, as a nuisance. Uh, we have retreated from a movement to spin, and it is very sad that we have done so because we have in our own history a model for how, by really arguing over the fundamental beliefs of what democracy is and what its possibilities are, that we can tackle the toughest problems in front of us. Nobody thought that we could deal with the race issue back in, in, in that era. No elected politician in the whole South was for this, uh, for, for this kind of change. It wasn't a division. It was a, a phalanx. We're not going to do it. And it happened anyway, and it happened in ways that liberated even the people who were fighting it the hardest. Uh, made them rich. But to me, it's a great irony that there's a tremendous amount of complaint about this on the part of people from my generation looking at it. It's as though they were walking along the street picking up hundred dollar bills that were strewn along. Oh, my daughter can go to Harvard. Oh, we're now a wealth, now we're in the Sun Belt. Uh, now we're respectable. Uh, now we don't have to worry about this race issue the, the way we used to. But as they're picking up the, the hundred dollar bills, they're saying it was a totally fraudulent uh, process and it didn't do any good. And I would, I'd be better off if it had never happened. So we have curdled against the promise of our own gift to the world, which was to set this democracy in motion as a way of handling the most difficult issues in the world. There have been no democracies for 2,000 years. When Madison was trying to figure out how you could make a democracy work without it falling apart like all the other attempts had since ancient Greece, he said that psychologically, underneath all of it, we're making two huge risks. One, that people can be self-governing individually and together that they can govern themselves without a king or a dictator or a general telling them what to do, giving them that external discipline. And he said, number two, we can build public trust among strangers. That's what votes are. All of history before that had said, we don't have public trust, we trust the king, and the king governs everybody else. We're trying to turn it inside out that we govern ourselves and we build public trust among strangers. That's what votes are. The Civil Rights Movement perfected that to the T and they did it consciously and they studied Madison, they studied the founding documents and nobody is more self-governing than a freedom rider who's looking at a Klansman who's about to hit him with a baseball bat and saying to them, you can hit me with that bat, and I may lose my life here, but either your children or my children or somebody else's children are going to be able to relate to each other more as human beings and equal citizens because of what we do here today, whatever happens. Trying to make a human contact, public trust, governing yourself. The people in the Civil Rights Movement, that's why I call them modern founders. They're trying to figure out a way, grounded in the premises of the American Revolution, to set in motion our own professed values.
This is a remarkable legacy that we have from these people, from these young people who are not studied and are not taken as a model. Diane Nash should be studied like Thomas Jefferson because in my view, she was doing exactly what the founders did. They were confronting systems of hierarchy and domination and injustice and exclusion and they were setting in motion equal citizenship and ways of solving these things. They did it with remarkable balance, with remarkable grace. Now they're responsible in some respects for the reason that we don't, some reasons that we don't appreciate this. Most of it is because it was coming out of a culture that most of America didn't know about. So we didn't see this, we didn't study it. How did they pull this off? How did they do this? Some of it is because even Diane Nash, in 1966, she told me once, she renounced nonviolence after being the paragon, the Joan of Arc of nonviolence for all this time, for 10 years. She said, if I've done all this by being nonviolent, think what I could do if I was willing to become an urban guerrilla and knock over a few banks for the revolution. Think what I could do. And she told me 10 years later she looked up and she hadn't knocked over any banks and she hadn't done any urban guerrillas. She hadn't even been to the rifle range. But that what she had done was to disengage from this arduous, agonizing involvement with the promise of freedom through nonviolence behind a big cloud of noise. So the movement itself renounced nonviolence. It was the first, it was the most powerful idea of the civil rights movement and it was the first one to become passe within the movement. And I will tell you today as a little secret, and it is an ugly secret, that in my interviews I have interviewed lots of people who were pioneers of nonviolence who are ashamed of it to this day because they say it was something that we had to do because we were so weak. It's a tool of the weak, something that you had to do. You know, why is it that Amer America only likes nonviolence in black people? Otherwise, it likes John Wayne and Bruce Willis. And, uh, and they get bloodier and dirtier to the end of every movie, and then they solve things with the violence. That's what we believe in. So why do I have to be nonviolent? And Dr. King would always have these arguments with Stokely Carmichael and these people and say, you're absolutely right. There is no reason in fairness that I should call upon you, having suffered already, to go out and invite more suffering on yourself to get other people to do what they should be doing in the first place. That's not fair, but what I'm trying to get you to see, it is leadership. That is a leadership technique to bring the whole rest of the country up to a higher standard. If we go back to violence saying we want to be like John Wayton too, we're stepping back to where white folks are, not up to where they are. We are a leadership technique for what the government is about. Think of it, Stokely. Democracy is nonviolence because it's a cathedral of votes and every vote is nothing but a little piece of nonviolence. That's all it is. Whether it's the board of this college or voting for Congress or voting for your little league team, we are millions of votes that run things. And that is true power. And, non and violence steps us back. So nonviolence died an early death. And many people from the black civil rights movement do not want to claim its benefits for Nelson Mandela, for, for the Berlin Wall, for China, for, for women, um, for gay people, for disabled people, for elderly, all the things that it did once we really started arguing about equal souls and equal votes. That's what, that's what, that was the slogan. You have an equal vote the same way you have an equal soul. In essence, that's what you have. Uh, they were saying, th that's, what we, that's what we have to have. That's what we're trying to develop. Equal souls and equal votes, this kind of balance. And Dr. King, and I'll just close here, because I hadn't talked very much about Dr. King, maybe that's what you expected. Um, on this notion of balance, on the fundamentals, and why the civil rights movement was about the essence of democracy, to redeem the soul of democracy. It wasn't just about black and white. In fact, he didn't even describe it in that language. The great genius of Martin Luther King in his rhetoric, here's a man that talked about religion and politics every day of his life, sometimes three, four, five, six speeches, had many enemies, 
America was never comfortable with Martin Luther King. Don't let anybody fool you on that either. He was getting um, speaking dates canceled at universities right up to the end of his life. So he had plenty of people, and the New York Times was trying to scold him and say, well, we admire you, but don't get involved in foreign policy, all that. People were looking for reasons to criticize him, and he was talking about religion and politics every day, but not once on the public record have I ever found an enemy, a critic, a superior intellectual criticizing Martin Luther King for mixing church and state. How can that be? Because that's all he did. And the only answer I can offer you, which comes out of this notion of balance and modern founder, is the way he did it. He did it with such consummate skill. He always put one foot in the scriptures and one foot in the Constitution, the Gettysburg Address, the Declaration of Independence, our, our founding principles. Not to subdue one to the other, with the other, which is what most argument about church and state does. People want to get politics out of the church's business, so they want to subdue politics with church beliefs or, or get the church out of politics. He said, take it either way, equal souls or equal votes. They are both the same thing. They come from the same root. They come from the same sort of respect. Uh, they come from the same sense of nonviolence, uh, the same sort of glow of justice in the world. And his rhetoric was unbelievably balanced. One day, the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down in lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream and for the most sacred values in our Judeo-Christian heritage. One foot there, one foot there. And that kind of balance is really a legacy that is valuable to us, and one day I think it will be valuable to the people in the Middle East as well. And for me, as a white Southerner who started out in my dad's dry cleaning plant, the abiding miracle that enthralled me, to my great surprise, for 24 years of my adult life, is that a movement coming right out from under my nose from an invisible black-led people who had never really experienced much of the blessings of democracy. That somehow they, out of faith and by studying democracy from the outside, they developed the, the political genius, the nonviolent will, and the indescribable grace to lift the rest of the country toward our own professed values. And that's a lesson that I think the rest of the world feels and that we sorely need if we hope to be able to work together through politics to tackle insoluble looking, terrible looking problems again. Because one way or another we will have them and our freedom movement is a great shining and sadly neglected lesson for how we should approach being citizens of faith and citizens of freedom uh, together again. Thank you very much. I told Bill I would answer questions and they don't have to be on what I said. I mean, actually on Clinton, or, uh, or Martin Luther King, or whether he was really only five foot six, or um, uh, any, anything else. It's a, it's a big subject, but I, I, tried, I tried to be provocative because I think, my basic idea is that I think America is brain dead to the depth and the intellectual uh, challenge of our own civic values, and that on violence alone, there's no subject more salient than violence. Universities ought to be studying violence and nonviolence, and what's the relationship with power. And the only place that I, as a student of nonviolence through Martin Luther King, find people really thinking about it is at the National War College. And I think that the military officers there are much more sophisticated about it than most of the rest of us. Yes, sir. Well, I think that part of it is that we've become cynical about government from both the right and the left. 
uh, in, in our politics. We have this spitball politics in place of movement politics. Now, where we've got two sides that are essentially saying that the world would be perfect if the other side dropped dead, uh, and neither side is thinking, uh, and, and neither side is really involved in, 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 in what the possibilities are of politics. I'm not saying through government, let alone through a government program or government um, appropriation or money. Uh, Self-government says that we shouldn't have deficits, you know, on, for political reasons. I'm not talking about just balancing the budget. So I'm not saying we shouldn't have arguments, but we, we have become cynical about politics, I think, in part in reaction to what happened to the 1960s. When I did the um, oral histories with Clinton, which was a totally different thing, I mean, this was, that was a pure historical exercise. Collect the president's oral history late at night so that the future will have unvarnished opinions. Um, uh, but one of the, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. No, no, I was just curious what you thought were the causes behind America's disinterest in the I, I think we're still, spirit, th right. You, you said the movement happened. To some degree, I still think we haven't digested the 60s. We haven't adjusted what it meant. There were a lot of excesses on all sides and people got their backs up and this, that, and the other. That's what I meant about Clinton. Clinton said in one of his musings one night, his mind is always going. Whether you like Clinton or not, and they're, they're, there's a lot on all sides, his mind's always going. He said, I can predict with 90% accuracy the votes of every Southerner to this day by asking one question do you think, on balance, the 60s were a good thing or a bad thing for America? And if they say it was a bad thing, then they're going to vote Republican <laughs> because it means they resent it, that, that it was a time when they were forced to change, they were, and, that, and that they had some sort of notion when everybody was white and the, and the, and the, the dad could have one career for his whole life and the, and the mom could stay home and work, and that all of that was ruined by agitations of hippies running around smoking marijuana. Um, and on the other hand, uh, uh, other people see that, that some kind of new promise was there. But there's a lot of cynicism on the left uh, against government, too. I mean, after all, um, people were mad at government for the Vietnam War. Women were mad at government for, um, uh, uh, for a lot of the oppressions through politics. So uh, the women's movement was mad. Um, and so we really haven't come to term. The 60s set in motion a lot of changes. And as a historian, I would, I mean, we're still dealing with it. I mean, the great irony is that most elections have been won since then in reaction to that, ever since Nixon came in with the Southern strategy and Reagan said government is the problem. And most elections are won on saying government is bad. And yet, here we are dealing with gay marriage <laughs> 30 or 40 years later in lightning speed, warp speed by historical. So empirically, we're still dealing with things set in motion by the liberal movement uh, of the 1960s about who are our common fair citizens, and yet all of our elections are saying government is bad and shouldn't be getting into any of that sort of thing. Um, and so you can see in one, you can see almost from both sides why both sides are mad. Uh, the conservatives are mad because they're, they're winning the election saying that government is bad and yet they're having to deal with one issue after another of another group, the old people and the disabled people and everybody wants these rights. And on the other hand, the people on the other side are saying, we've done these things that everybody supports. Nobody in this country now does not support Title IX for women's athletics. It passed over Reagan's veto in a bill sponsored by Bob Dole to mandate that all of, you know, in 1987, to mandate that women have the same right to play sports in colleges as men. That was an unheard of idea, but we take it as commonplace now, and everybody's, the parent of every daughter would be mad if, if they, so in some respects, we're, we're, we value the benefits of things that the movement set in motion, but politically we haven't figured out a way to absorb them. We're still fighting over, over what it did, and I think 
a lot of us are really scared of the notion that we might have to trust as citizens each other enough to say we've got a real terrible problem with our lack of industry or with our environment or with our energy and we've got to figure out a way to handle it again together and it's going to involve a lot of argument but the first thing you have to do is to believe that it's possible to do something like that and that's why the movement is such an amazing example because here you have Martin Luther King who can't vote and he's got only 10 percent of the population and most of them are inert um, and he's saying we we can fix segregation so it's hard to get that kind of hope again. So I think that a lot of the optimism from that period has atrophied in the debates over, the lingering debates over what the 60s mean for the promise of politics. And on both sides, we, we are a cynical age. I mean, I think one of the saddest things now is that when people say we're cynical, that's just a statement of fact. That's not a lament. That's not a how do we get over it. That's anything. Well, we're cynical. Um, so, um, so it's almost like we need a movement to get out of our own cynicism. And so how do we do that? And nobody's offering very much because most people are still saying the only way to get out of it is for the other side to drop dead. That is not going to do it. <laughs> That's not going to do it from either side. Yes? Yeah, so I, oh. I, yes, sir. I would like to, you know, my, my feelings are is that we're in a whole different kind of uh, age and situation now with the intervention of technology and the Internet that's driving our public opinion so much. You know, through Fox, through Glenn Beck, uh, O'Reilly, you got him on them side and Oprah on the other side, and all these things that are. And you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm concerned that maybe the infiltration of this kind of information is going to be the thing that's going to is is going to be this in the same kind of situation as the explosion of the civil rights movement in the '60s, in a way, because that will shape and determine, you know, how we feel and how we think. Well, but remember. The internet has hundreds of millions of people uh, involved in putting input. You know, it broadens the share. Bill O'Reilly has a huge audience, but he, his audience is two million people. I mean, um, it, 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 it's, it's outsized. It's a condition of how we interact, but it doesn't define how we interact. In the civil rights movement, there were literally, um, when they couldn't get attention to their sufferings, they had meetings about what to do about that, which would be the analogy of what do we do about Bill O'Reilly or how do we communicate in the internet age. And in their day, it meant that they had to get the phone number, the home number, and they had to find out what the re reporter for the New York Times wife did and make friends with her and start telling them when we're going to do these things and try to cultivate them to get them to cover these stories. So that the media problem is a problem of the movement. It's part of your challenge to draw attention to what your message is if your message is that we can solve this problem uh, together. So, get it out so much faster now. Now it's a worldwide network. Exactly. Well, but see, so that may make things better, not, not worse. I mean, certainly the movement in the Middle East uh, that's going on right now was fueled a lot by the Internet. And in China, I guarantee you, in China, did you see the other day they just, um, they just had a thing <laughs> that the word jasmine is, is now forbidden because of the jasmine revolution. China is so worried about it that you can't even say jasmine uh, over the internet in China. So they're all hunkered down trying to figure out what to do about this. So all these media things cut, they cut both ways. And what I'm trying to say is that not every one of them, it may be uh, adverse, it may be positive, but it's a condition. Uh, the movement is, the, is, is what we do with those conditions and, and, and how we uh, work with them. And the first condition of a movement is that whatever it is, you're not going to be resigned to it. If it's a problem, we're going we're to noodle and argue and yell at each other. And, and if we can't figure out a solution, then we're going to say, well, is anybody else thinking about this? That's, you know, that's the kind of Diane Nash I always used to say that her image, looking back at the movement, her most common image of her before every big argument or demonstration was that it was like her wedding day in a very specific way that her knees were shaking <laughs> and that she was nervous and she knew she was about to take a leap and she didn't know how it was going to turn out, but it was defining. 
And in, in a certain sense, that's what citizenship is when there's really something at stake. And so these things about the movements are really uh, conditions, but, but not, you know, not the basic. Yes, sir, you had a question? I, again, I think it cuts both ways. Because the media were not as, we weren't as inter interconnected then, they really did think that they had to do it themselves, that there was something physical, that the movement was something that you did, not something that you heard about or that you established. So that the question, Diane Nash's question was, where is your body? Um, are you willing to put your body on the line for this? Now, the, the fact though is, that even the great demonstrations in Birmingham with the dogs and fire hoses that had such an enormous political impact wouldn't have had that political impact if it hadn't been for television uh, and news media, which was in that day considered revolutionary just like the internet is now. So um, the technology is immobilizing to the, to the extent that it says all I need to do to be involved is to be passive and sit here and play on my computer. Uh, it connects you in the sense that if you're willing to engage in these things and put your body on the line and think about it, it gives you a way to magnify your thoughts uh, that, di that didn't exist before. So, uh, you know, I think it cuts both ways. Yes, ma'am. What can we look forward to? Yeah. Well, I think Obama's whole world has been changed by two things. One, the collapse of the economy, uh, the collapse of the finance system, which unfortunately um, um, feeds, again, it cuts both ways. There's urgency to do something to fix the economy, and yet b because we're broke, People are saying government can't afford to do it, we're, we're, we're all on our own. So essentially where we're headed, I think, is an argument about whether we have to try to face all of these overriding serious social problems on our own as though the government didn't exist, or whether we can figure out some sort of new political way to engage them. Obama hadn't gotten very far on the second task, which is what I think that he was elected for. Certainly, that was what Clinton said to me by the end of our talk, that his purpose was to try to rehabilitate our sense that we could accomplish things through politics, not necessarily through government, or certainly not a government program, but that we, by debate, could say, okay, we've got a big problem with foreign oil, or with the environment, or with our healthcare system, and can we figure out some way to make progress on the analogy of what we did in the Civil Rights Movement, or for that matter, uh, in the American Revolution, or, or the Progressive Movement, uh, where, where, where in which we came together and we did things that benefited everybody's life. I mean, think about it. The Civil Rights Movement affects invisibly the everyday life of millions of people in the South whose lives and their expectation, the, the things that they take for granted, the fears they no longer have, the opportunities that they have, uh, it, it has affected everyday reality in a way th that could be treasured. And we have to figure out if we can do things like that again. Now, that's one problem for Obama on the economy which has gotten worse um, and made it harder to, to resuscitate our, our belief that we can tackle these big problems with whatever you know, solutions we can come up with. I'm not prescribing the solutions. But first of all, we have to say, okay, our politics might be the avenue to help facilitate this, to help liberate business or, or this, that, and the other. Um, the other problem, of course, is 
the Middle East really is changing Obama's foreign policy in the sense that um, it, it's forcing us to decide whether or not whether or not our, our foreign policy can be an effective instrument for the promotion of democracy overseas and whether that will um, make us a better uh, force in the world or not. You know, right now in the Middle East, so far, we've been very subtle and very restrained, and a lot of it has been over what our military is going to do, and uh, a lot of it is through uh, violence. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen. We're nervous about what's going to happen in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I mean, that Saudi Arabia is the, is the harshest uh, monarchy in the whole region, but we get so much oil from there. So um, he has a big problem about whether our practical economic problems, how to reconcile that with, um, w with what we stand for uh, overseas. And, um, you know, he's, he's very smart, um, but he's lost an election. He's got uh, less wherewithal right now. And, uh, and, and I think that he has bigger problems. He, he came into office knowing that he had big problems, and I think they've gotten worse on, on um, certainly on the economic front and on, on the bud budgetary front. So I feel, when I went to, I went to see him last year uh, for, on Martin Luther King Day um, and had a nice little lunch with him. Now, this was before the health care bill passed, and he'd just been in office for one day. I'm, I'm not talking about last month, I'm, uh, a year ago. And um, uh, he, he didn't talk very much, but she did. <laughs> she, she said that they, that they felt very battered and, and that it was a lot harder than they thought. And uh, the line I remember from her the most was she said, it's a lot harder than we thought to get the country to care about anything that matters. That, that our politics are so used to, you know, who's wearing a dress or who's, who's insulted who, so much in the, in the kind of um, uh, entertainment tonight <laughs> view of politics. And um, I, 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 there was a note of despair, I, but I, I don't know what her, um, what her attitude is now. I hadn't, I hadn't seen her. Yes? Um, he was he was driven to a much his mind was driven. He was talk, We were talking usually between twelve and two o'clock in the morning uh, up in the residence because he was petrified that his staff would find out what we were doing and leak it, and then it would get out in the paper, and then they would all want the tapes that we were making. Um, so we would talk really late at night, and yet and he'd been working, and he'd be talking to me, and out on his feet but his mind going all the time and several times, and I, I put this in the book, several times I would see his eyes roll up under his eyelids and it looked like he was going to sleep and, and I would say, Mr. President, you all right? But he'd keep talking. Uh, um, and when he was talking, he was thinking. He, um, I think the most, the common theme to express what he was trying to do, he really, was a, a very strange combination of a, a terminal policy wonk. Everybody knows that. He knows election statistics from every district. He, he, he knew how the hybrid technology for the hybrid car, we were talking about that five years before it came out. I mean, he, he knows these encyclopedic things, and yet he says none of it is worth a tinker's dam, which is one of his favorite words. If you don't have a personal connection with the people that you need to make these wonkish ideas mean anything in the world. So for him, and so something like the Middle East peace process, where he knows the name of every street sign and every checkpoint in, in, in the West Bank doesn't mean anything unless he knows what kind of humor Yasser Arafat can share with Yitzhak Rabin so that they can talk about their families or something like that, you know. Um, and he's desperately trying to get jokes and, uh, um, 
and make connections. And one of the times I saw him most frustrated was he said he never could make a personal connection with John Zemin, the president of China. Um, and he got frustrated. He says, if, if I'm gifted at anything, it's being able to talk to somebody and make a connection with them and find out something about them where I have a sense of them as a human being. He said, I've talked to this guy for five years uh, and, and nothing gets through. And he, and he said, John Zeming says to me, um, you're telling me about human rights. You're telling me about your freedoms. You're, you lecture me all the time, but your people are unruly. Um, your schools don't work. Your economy uh, is weakening. Who's to say your freedom is worth it? You know, and, and uh, Clinton was frustrated that, 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 that's, that he couldn't make a personal connection there. Um, an amazing, amazing mind. I went in there pretty, I had known him as, as, a, as a kid. We, we, uh, uh, but then I didn't see him for 20 years and he called me back to, to do this oral history because he read the footnotes in my King books. He said, your footnotes come from all these things in the presidential libraries. I want to have records like that in my library. Um, uh, and we, we, we did all of this thing and I, I was surprised by his mind, and in the end, um, I mean, if you read the book, anybody reads any of the book on Clinton, it'd be interesting whether you agree with me or not, because I try to just report what happened and describe what it's like to be with the President of the United Just getting in and out of the White House was an adventure for me a lot of times. Um, Did you address that in your book? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. But things, a lot of things didn't go well. Um, once I tried to take him a Christmas present, and uh, I had no idea because I would, I would get ushered right up to his office. But when I brought in a Christmas present, um, and uh, I was coming in in the daytime, it was the only time I did a daytime interview. This was the last one I would ever do. I had to go through a different entrance, and they had a screener there, and I had a Christmas present. And they said, well, we can't have this. It's wrapped, you know. Uh, and I said, well, unwrap it and I'll rewrap it. They said, no, we, the president does not want us to do this. So now I'm in standard protocol for how to give a present to the president. And I'm saying, I'm supposed to be upstairs, keep the present. Um, and because I said that, then I had to go have an interview with somebody in the security office. You know, it took me forever to get. So it's a, it's a very, very bizarre world. And once I told him, <laughs> once, He'd just pop out with things, because he'd be talking about the Middle East peace process, he'd be talking about um, um, Bosnia, he'd be talking about Dole, dealing with Dole, dealing with the Congress, and, and then all of a sudden he'd say, I only have one regret about being the parent of an only child. Um, he said, I've always wanted to teach my kid how to play golf, and Chelsea does not care about playing golf. And uh, so, so I said to him, well, Mr. President, um, I am a terrible golfer, but my son loves to play golf. If you ever want to borrow a son to teach golf, you can do that. This is walking out the door. About three months later, I get the next call. Can you come down and do an interview tonight with the president? But first, can you go to school and bring your son and his golf clubs? This was in 1998. My son was 14 years old. We went down. Uh, he had been to the White House a couple of times and was very underwhelmed by it because to him it was just a very, very talkative, know-it-all family um, uh, in, their, in, their, in their dining room. Um, so he was kind of put upon that I was taking him down there. We had his golf clubs. I'm driving down. I've got all my stuff to do my interviews driving down, and he says, you have to promise you're not going to tell anybody that you took me down to play golf with the president, because if it gets back to my friends, uh, they'll see me as trying to put on airs. Uh, my, my son's a very unusual character. So we arrive. He's prepared to get over, underwhelmed again. He drives in. There's a big crisis with Saddam Hussein. This was 
you know, Clinton had air, air strikes on Iraq several times uh, because of the weapons inspectors and Saddam Hussein. There's a big crisis. He's about to send in more air strikes. We're on DEFCON 3 or something like that alert. We drive up into the, <laughs> we get cleared into the, into the ellipse right behind, under the Truman balcony, which was where I would park um, to do my interviews. But this is the daytime. So we were going to do the interview that night, um, but I had to get there for Franklin to play golf with the president. Of course, you never know whether this is going to happen or not. You can go down there and you know, be sent back home. I was sent back home plenty of times because uh, something, something happened. But anyway, we show up, and under the Truman balcony, there's a motorcade that had twice as many security vehicles as I have ever seen, and all of the of the, of the uh, Secret Service people had their guns out, which I had never seen, you know what I mean? Because of this crisis with Saddam Hussein, and Franklin gets, <laughs> gets out of the car, <laughs> and this person comes and gets him with a gun and said, you are guest number one, and where are your clubs, and took him to a separate car, and he looked like, I thought he was gonna have a heart attack. Because he had never seen the pomp, you know. For him, it was just like having, at our dinners, it was just like having dinner with another family, except Clinton and Hillary were always talking about, you know, testimony and issues and stuff like that that he didn't understand. He did like the fact that you could say at the dinner in the White House, could I have some French fries? And they would make homemade, like, waffle fries. He said the best things he ever had. That to him was... <laughs> the best part of the White House until we get there and we go out to the Army Navy Club and walk up to the first tee and there are 400 people there because they heard the president is going to play and he's got this little kid. Um, and I was petrified that Franklin wouldn't, be, wouldn't hit the ball, you know. But I, I, it, it was unbelievable. Clinton, every hole all the way around, and I was giving him a lot of distance because uh, I knew he went. He put his arm around Franklin, who was very short um, and, and young, and say, "Now you want to start the ball out on the right and try to draw it back, and this, that, and the other." And and he was having the time of his life teaching him. And they would go around all around the course, and there were all kind of secret sniper snipers because because of the security thing they're out there you see snipers and you see guys with with um, these incredible uh, gigantic uh, binoculars scanning the trees and we're going around and you, but you wouldn't have known anything like that we're talking just about the golf I was immensely proud of my son that he actually hit the ball and seemed to be having a great time and they went around. They both birdied uh, the same hole, uh, which was really great. And that's when I ran up there. I actually was at least 100 yards away. Most of them are 50 yards away. But when they birdied the first, the same hole, I ran up there just to congratulate them. And happened to overhear what Franklin later told me was the only comment other than where to hit the ball the whole time. <laughs> Clinton had his arm around Franklin, and he turned to him, and he said, you know, Franklin, that Saddam Hussein is a son of a bitch. <laughs> and that's all he said. And then he went back to golf. So you never knew. You never knew what was going to happen. And the president was very mad at me for this book um, because I put personal. It's a mix. The book is really a, almost a, I try to take people on my shoulder, my reaction. Sometimes he would ask me questions. You know, he asked me once, should I fire the CIA director? Uh, I mean, he asked me all kind of things. And so I'm trying to give people my experience of it. But he, um, I put in things that were personal to leaven all of the political stuff because the political stuff was so intricate and, and so specific that I thought most people wouldn't read it. So. Um, so I had to leaven the Bosnia with a little, you know, uh, what the, uh, the waffle fries are like in the White House or uh, how Clinton would sneak into the, uh, sneak into the kitchen uh, when Hillary was away and bring out bean dip and eat it on the, on the Truman balcony while we were talking. Um, and that <laughs> we could be there on the Truman balcony out in the middle of the night, sitting outside talking, and I had my little recorders, and we'd be talking, we'd be covering everything that had happened in the last month. Then the next week I went back, and we were in his 
little parlor room right off the bedroom. And um, he said, um, we can't sit there because the window, um, you can see from the ellipse down there through this window and the Secret Service says somebody could take a shot at me. And I said, Mr. President, last week or last month I was here and we sat out on the Truman balcony and there wasn't even a window. Uh, and they didn't say anything about it. Why are they upset about this? He said, well, it's because <laughs> when they decided to change the glass on this window to make it harder to shoot through, which they haven't done yet, it got a security risk and their, and their procedures in here about protecting me at this window, but not at the Truman balcony. Uh, so we would go through all these crazy, um, crazy things. But in the middle of all this, one of them, he said, uh, that he admired Chelsea. Ch Chelsea was quitting ballet. And he said out of the blue, on the tapes, said he had always admired Chelsea because she had a gift that he didn't, which was that she loved things for their own sake, whether or not she was gifted in them, and that she was four inches taller <laughs> than all the other ballerinas, and at least 20 pounds heavier because of that height, and that because of that, her feet had bled after every rehearsal for 10 years. Um, but that she did it anyway because she loved ballet, including, all, including the stuff that she knew she was never going to be the number one at. And he said, I could never do that. He said, I've known I was gifted in politics from the time I was a kid, and it's the only thing where I really put myself out there. He said, even my music and my saxophone I always do it as kind of half a joke with a little laugh so that nobody, so that I won't make myself vulnerable for somebody saying that I'm a second-rate saxophonist. And he said, I've always admired Chelsea for not worrying about that. She doesn't care what anybody thinks. She loves ballet and she's done it for 10 years and that he wrote her a note about that one night and he described this note that he wrote to her. Well, I put all of that in the book. So when the book comes out, or when he gets the manuscript, he calls up, just towering rage. You're naive. You have no idea how people will distort that. They will say that I'm calling my own daughter fat, and that I don't like her, and this, that, and the other. And um, you know, I'm saying, Mr. President, with all the other politics there, the point of this whole thing is to show that the, that the people who run a people's government are human beings too, and that you have to have these things in there. And I think most people will like this because I think that story is, says something nice about you and nice about uh, Chelsea. And he said, Taylor, that's why you're a historian. You don't understand anything about politics. Um, you don't understand how mean-spirited uh, people are. And he said, I agreed to expose myself to history through the tapes and it was actually his idea that I write a memoir because he said no historians ever had anything like this. I agreed to expose myself to that, but Chelsea didn't sign on for this and Hillary didn't sign on for this. And I said, well, they didn't sign off of it either and they're there and this is an honest account and I, if, I, if I say I want to make it a shaded, dishonest account, uh, you know, I can't do it. So he hung up and he was really mad. And there were a whole bunch of things like that in the book that were too personal and he, and he thought they were going to get distorted and he felt very um, uh, protective of his family. He said, if I've done anything, uh, I, I, he said with one glaring exception, he said, if I've done anything, it's been to try to protect my family. But anyway, a few months later he called up and said, tip, another typical Clinton, and this is one of the last conversations we've had, this is not long ago, called up and said, well, you were right and I was wrong. He said, I've been traveling around and whenever people come up and talk to me about your book, they seem to like all the stuff in there about Hillary and Chelsea. And it hadn't caused this big thing like that. And, and, uh, but I think that he's still a little, uh, a little raw about the family. But it, it, it's an amazing mind, I, I will say that. And, um, um, I haven't been around that many presidents. Well, the first one I met was Eisenhower, but um, when I was a little kid. 
but Clinton's the one I've been around the most, and so I don't really don't have much uh, comparative experience. But it was an amazing experience to be with a sitting president. I think we had 79 interviews, uh, mostly at midnight. Could you all please join me in thanking Taylor Branch? Thank you.